Good morning, and welcome to this service of worship with the Congregation of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Mark Schaefer, and I'm the senior pastor here at St. Matthew's. And on my own behalf, and on behalf of all the leadership of our congregation, it is my privilege to welcome you to worship with us this morning. Wherever you have come from, whatever you believe or doubt, whatever is on your heart this morning, either joy or sorrow, you are welcome here. And so I invite you to join in the greeting and the call to worship that is found in our order of service. You have come from afar and waited long and are wearied. Let us sit side by side, sharing the same bread, drawn from the same source, to quiet the same hunger that makes us weak. Then standing together, let us share the same spirit, the same thoughts that once again draw us together in friendship and unity and peace. I invite you now to join in singing our opening hymn, number 111, How Can We Name a Love? Give us, Lord, a little sun, a little happiness, and some work. Give us a heart to comfort those in pain. Give us the ability to be good, strong, wise, and free, so that we may be as generous with others as we are with ourselves. Finally, Lord, let us all live as your own one family. Amen.
you're standing, please be seated. A couple of announcements uh, this morning. Uh, today is um, Communion Sunday, which means there is a special offering. The United Methodist Church has 12 such special offerings throughout the year. And so I invite you um, to make note of that when you're doing your giving, either online or um, via check, via mail, um, to make note of the special offering for this Sunday. Um, I also would like to remind you that house parties are being organized. House parties is in quotes, you can't hear the quotes, and I don't really want to do the air quote thing. Um, but what that means is we are organizing a number of uh, gatherings via Zoom um, so that I can get to meet the people that I've been preaching to for the past month that I haven't had a chance to see yet. Um, so uh, Sarah sent out an email through the church um, email system you should all have received. It's an opportunity to sign up for one of a number of either uh, dinner time or lunchtime house parties in which uh, in small groups we can get to know one another. So I encourage you to RSVP for those. Um, I would also like to lift up um, those of you who have joys and concerns that you would like to share. Um, we do our best to be aware of those um, and lift them up here in worship. But also, if you have one that you would like to share with our prayer team um, so that they can continue to pray for those that you share with us here in worship, I invite you to contact Donna Lane and to email her at joysandconcerns at stmatthews-bui.org. Um, and th that way that will get to her and to all the folks who need to have that information. Uh, I'd also like to announce that beginning this Tuesday at noon, I will be starting a series of weekly lunchtime sermon and sandwich, uh, not sermon, scripture and sandwich gatherings, some informal Bible study. Um, so if you have a lunch break and um, you want to join in with me and going through some scripture lessons and some Bible study, um, I invite you to do that. No prior experience with the Bible is required. Um, I, you know, and actually, if you need a copy, we can send you the text that we'll use. Um, but I invite you to do that, to join in on Tuesdays at noon. And you need to make, uh, you know, a, a seven, eight week commitment. You can come in week by week um, as we do this. Uh, information for that um, is in this past uh, midweek messenger and will be in my uh, pastoral epistle uh, this afternoon. Are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up at this time? If not, then I invite you to turn to an attitude of prayer as we join in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh God, source of all that makes life possible, giver of all that makes life good, we gather to give you our thanks, yet we confess that we have often failed to live our thankfulness. What we have, we take for granted, and we grumble about what we lack. We have squandered your bounty with little thought of those who will come after us. We are more troubled by the few who have more than by the many who have less. Forgive us, O oh God. In this hour of worship, accept our thanksgiving and teach us to make gratitude and sharing our way of life. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, amen. Hear the good news that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And as a forgiven and a reconciled people, I invite us to share in signs of Christ's peace with those either seated next to us at home or watching and sharing virtually with us via Facebook live stream to make comments in the, in the video to share signs of peace with one another. Peace be with you. Good morning, our joys and concerns today. Um, Pat Clooney is doing well after her surgery on Tuesday. Um, and may we pray that she continues to heal. Today I'm asking for prayers for Dee Dee Greaves' family. Her father, Clarence Weeper, passed away yesterday. So if we could please um, ask God to give them peace during this time and bring them comfort through the memories. Karen Hastings, if we could pray for her, she is starting her radiation treatment. And prayers for Bill Willoughby for his health concerns. Healing prayers for Joellen Thompson. And prayers for nine-year-old Alexis Delphi and her family. She's starting her cancer treatments. 
If we could please lift all those up in our prayers. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather this morning to be your people, to reflect upon your word, to reflect upon your summons to us for our lives. As we gather, we remember our bonds one to another, our duty to care one for another. And so it is that we pray for one another in our times of need. We lift up to you the names of those we have read aloud and the names of those we carry silently upon our hearts. We entrust them to your safekeeping. We entrust them to your healing grace and mercy. For we pray, O oh God, for all those who are sick. We pray for all those who experience brokenness in the body. We pray for those who experience brokenness of heart or mind or spirit. For those who experience brokenness of relationship. For those who experience brokenness in their communities. Who experience the brokenness of poverty, or violence, or despair. We pray for all those who experience the brokenness of unjust structures, those who suffer from racial discrimination and injustice, those who are marginalized because of whom they love. We pray for all those who experience the brokenness of war, the brokenness of environmental catastrophe and degradation, the brokenness that comes from systems of oppression and violence around the world. We pray, O oh God, for the very healing of the world itself. Lord, we lift these things up to you, not out of wishful thinking or a vain hope, but because we have seen you active in our lives. We have seen it in the multiplication of five loaves and two fish. We have seen it in the healings of those who seemingly could not be healed. We have seen it in the restoration of those who had died. And we have seen it most of all in the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. And so, O oh God, we lift up all these prayers to you and more. In the name of the one in whose life, death and resurrection, we have our hope. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing hymn number 599, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
The reading from the Hebrew scriptures this morning is from the book of Genesis. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he had, did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord. Please join me for the congressional response, Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips dree and deceit. From your let me vindication come, let your eyes see the right. In your try my heart, if you visit me by night. If you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. Concerning what others do, I have avoided the ways of the violent by following your word. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for, your an for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge, from their adversaries at your right hand. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with beholding your presence. Please join us for the gospel acclamation. Alle, alle, alle. Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord.
Good morning, children of God. I'm so, so happy that you've joined us this morning. In today's gospel story, the disciples have a problem. A huge crowd is gathered to hear Jesus, and as they look around, they notice that they don't have enough food to feed them all. In fact, for the crowd of 5,000 people, they have two fish and only five loaves of bread. I don't know about you, but if I have a party at my house, I, and that's only like 30 people before the pandemic, I had more than five loaves of bread and two fish. So can you imagine two fish and five loaves of bread for just your family's dinner? Or maybe we're having a potluck, because you know we like potlucks, in Fellowship Hall. Are five loaves of bread and two fish going to feed us all? Now, here's a picture of 100 people, just 100. You would have to have 50 sets of these to make 5,000. And they had two fish, five loaves of bread. That's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people. So the disciples were getting worried, and they suggested that Jesus send the people home or send the people to the village to get food, to buy food. But Jesus surprises them. First, he says, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Then Jesus says, bring it here to me. So he blesses the food, the five loaves, two fish, and the disciples take it out among the people and feed them. So not only was there enough for 5,000 people, but they had 12 baskets left over. Can you imagine? A miracle. Isn't God amazing? From five loaves of bread and two fish, he fed 5,000 people. Can you imagine what he can do for you? One. Now, let's learn what this means for us. I think the first thing we learn is that God is amazing and can do miracles. And he will provide for us. He knows what we need and has compassion for us, grace and mercy and love for us. Each of you, every single person. He has enough love for every single person. We, like the disciples, are called to distribute, to pass out or share that compassion, that grace and mercy and love that God gives us with people that we meet. So what would that look like? Well, by wearing your face mask, this is just an example, concerning the times, you are telling others by wearing it out in public, you're showing them that God's compassion, you have God's compassion and care to others. We're saying to everyone we see that we care about them, about their health, that we're thinking about them. And that's why I wear a face mask. We have so much think about it. We have so many books and toys and things and food. Can we, can you, share with others? How could we do that? Can you offer God's compassion, love, and mercy to others we meet? Do you stand up for someone being bullied? Do you ask a friend or someone that you don't know who's not joining in games or sitting alone to join you? Do you hold the door for people? Do you help around the house? These are all ways we can offer and show God's compassion and love that he has for us to others. So I know it's a hard question and sometimes it's hard to do. So you could ask your mom and dad ways that you can help other people and that you can show compassion, and you can pray about it. 
I'm sure you have ideas on how you can do that. So God plan provides us what we need. Sometimes life seems a little painful or hard, sometimes even impossible. But because of Christ's work, we know that we are already promised God's grace, life in heaven. We pray for daily bread with the understanding that God has granted all we need for life. We bring what we have to God and he works miracles. So I would love to see how you at home show your compassion for others. So I would like the Facebook page flooded with pictures of you and your mask or pictures of some, you doing something that shows God's love for others. I can't wait to see them. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for using whatever we have for your will. Please help us to trust in you and let our lives be used for your glory. We know you will always provide and make great things out of small things. Thank you for miracles. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you, excuse me, will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Now, God, may the words which are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and touched by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are times when the author of a story writes themselves into a narrative corner. That is, in the interest of good drama, they have created a situation in which the characters and the hero are in peril and greatly challenged, overwhelmed even by this opposition and the circumstances faced. And the writer wants to make the challenges real and significant so that the reader or the viewer will feel genuine concern for the fate of the hero. And that's necessary if the hero is to be appealing to the reader or to the viewer, if people are expected to identify with the hero. It's why someone even as all-powerful as, say, Superman always has a kryptonite that makes them weaker or more vulnerable. But sometimes the author is too clever for their own good and gets their hero into so much trouble that they have no idea how to get them out of it. The ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus came up with a convenient solution. He would have an actor lowered down onto the stage playing a god, being hoisted down from a crane, a Greek called a mechana, and resolve the situation. The Latin term for this plot device is called deus ex machina, literally god from the machine. The Greek playwright Euripides really likes this plot device, and some half of all of his tragedies end with God or a God coming down from the machine to rescue people. 
It wasn't universally popular. Some Greek critics, like Antiphanes, criticized it, and he wrote, when they don't know what to say and have completely given up on the play, just like a finger they lift the machine and the spectators are satisfied. But the practice of deus ex machina, either with literal gods arriving on the scene or simply unanticipated external circumstances or luck to resolve a plot device, continue in tragedy and drama, and they continue today. Some notable deus ex machinas show up in The Wizard of Oz, in Superman, in Avatar, in Pacific Rim, in Saving Private Ryan, and of course, War of the Worlds. And there's a reason it keeps showing up. It's because we like it. We're ha we like happy endings. We want a hero who, to be saved. And if God or space aliens or a previously unknown ability or a bacterium is going to save the day for us, then so much the better. We're all for it. It's one of the reasons we find scripture lessons like today so satisfying. Because Jesus has just heard the news about the death of John the Baptist. He has decided to withdraw for a time into a deserted place. But when he arrives at the other shore, already there is a crowd waiting for him, and moved with compassion, he heals them in their need. I want us to just pause for a moment to consider, to consider this. Jesus learns that John the Baptist has been killed by Herod, and he decides to take some time apart from himself, and he finds instead this large crowd waiting and wanting something from him. And he gives it to them out of his abundant compassion for them. This already is something unexpected. If this is already surprising. See, if Jesus had said, as he does in the, in the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, there's too many of you, heal yourselves, we would have cut him some slack on that, I think. We could hardly have blamed him. We would likely have praised him for his good boundaries and self-care. But he heals them. And then when it is evening, the disciples come and say, this is a deserted place. The hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and get something to eat. When Jesus tells the disciples to feed the crowd, they respond that they only have five loaves and two fish. This is quite a predicament our heroes have found themselves in. And the text says that there are 5,000 men. We're using the Greek word that specifically means males as opposed to people, which means there were actually a great deal more than 5,000 folks there. And Jesus comes to the rescue with a power we didn't realize he'd had before. He multiplies the loaves and fishes, a deus ex Nazareth, if you will. So much so does he magnify and multiply this food that they have 12 baskets left over. It's the surprise and unexpected ending to this story. But here's the thing. What if it wasn't meant to end that way? See, when the disciples first present this problem to Jesus, his response is direct. You give them something to eat. Now, in Greek, as in English, when the, the second person pronoun is not necessary in a command, we say, come over here, not you come over here. That's because the pronoun is understood, at least if we learned what we were supposed to have learned in school. So when it shows up, there's a special significance to that, a special emphasis. Jesus doesn't just say, give them something to eat. He says, you give them something to eat. Now, Jesus is made aware of this massive problem. Thousands of people have come out to him, and they're lacking in food. And Jesus turns around and tells the disciples that they should solve this problem themselves. But all they have is five loaves two fish. In Mark's gospel, this story serves as yet another example of the disciples' lack of faith. Jesus has to solve their problem for them. But that doesn't seem to be what's happening in Matthew's telling of it. So does Jesus really intend to put this all on us? Because I've got to tell you, 
it doesn't usually end well when that's the case. See, the temptation in religion is to make it all about us. The temptation is to center everything around our response. We imagine that if we are good enough, if we do the right things, if we do good deeds, if we say our prayers, if we tithe to the church, if we're good little Christians, then we've earned a punched ticket to the good part of the afterlife. And it's such a tempting way to look at things, especially because making it all about us gives us some measure of control. I mean, sure, we've been told that this is all about God's grace, that God has already taken care of all of this for us. But what if the paperwork gets lost? Shouldn't we show up with our own records, maybe a resume of how righteous we are? Shouldn't we at least have a spiritual resume that vouches for us? And even after the Protestant Reformation, we still find ourselves seduced by thinking we have to do everything. I mean, we might accept that salvation is not accomplished by doing the right works, say. But surely it's about believing the right things. There's still something we have to do, right? There's still something we can do, even if it's just with our minds rather than with our hands. Now, in addition to trying to make ourselves the center of salvation, there's another way that we run into trouble. When we focus on what we're doing, we can often forget that our visions of the kingdom of God and God's vision of the kingdom are not the same thing. See, we frequently have a pretty low bar set when it comes to what we imagine the kingdom of God to be like. And throughout history, all manner of associations have been made with the kingdom of God. Various political movements were identified with the kingdom of God, and events were tied to that understanding. The now practically unheard of Liberty Party from the 19th century was at its founding, described in terms that equated it with the second coming of Christ over the centuries and the years, we've often looked for the kingdom as something that we could build. And in so doing, we usually settle. We decide the Roman Empire is the kingdom until it falls. Then St. Augustine, Augustine has to remind us that it wasn't all along. Then we decide the church is the kingdom until it falls into corruption. And Martin Luther has to remind us that it wasn't. Then we decide that colonies like the Plymouth Colony or nation states like the British Empire or the American Empire are the kingdom of God until we fail to live up our, to our values and a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King has to remind us that it wasn't the kingdom. And what's worse is that we sometimes try to construct utopias that aim at establishing God's kingdom, but we wind up creating yet another human institution that oppresses, that destroys, that perpetuates injustice. So we can't seem to get this right. And even when we're really well-meaning and trying our hardest, we seem to cause harm. So we get into trouble when we think it's all about us doing everything. But is the other option any better? Waiting for God to take all the initiative. I mean, it reminds me of that old joke, and, and I'm sure the fact that I have now just said that old joke, half of you, or probably the majority of you, are now thinking of the joke I'm about to tell you, the joke about the man caught on his roof during a flood. A man, his, his flood, he's caught on his roof, and a man in a boat comes by and says, get in! And the man says, God will save me. The water rises higher, and another boat a few hours later comes by with a number of people in it, and they say, get in! And the man once again responds, God will save me. And the water rises even higher until he's perched atop his chimney, and a helicopter flies over and lowers down a ladder, and they shout to the loudspeaker, climb up! And he yells back, God will save me! And the waters finally rise, and he is swept away and drowned. And when he gets to heaven, he says to God, why didn't you save me? And God said, what do you want? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. And as silly as that attitude is for the sake of the joke, we see it all the time. I don't need a mask. God will save me from COVID. There are entire theologies out there that tell people that modern medicine, that believing in modern medicine is either 
a mistake in believing that the body is somehow actually real, or that it's a sign that you don't have enough faith in God to save you from all manner of illness and injury, and that if you truly had faith, you would wait for God to heal you or your child. I don't need to take any precautions. God will keep me safe. That can't be a better alternative to trying to do everything ourselves, can it? Can the solution to our arrogant insistence on our version of the kingdom of God or our all too confident reliance on our own abilities really be to just pass all personal responsibility onto God, all initiative onto God? Is the response to you give them something to eat really? Nah, better not, Jesus. You know how badly I'm likely to screw that up. Now, it's fair to say but why shouldn't we wait for God to do something? Have you seen the size of the problems that are out there? Indeed, that's true. And to be fair, when Jesus told the disciples to feed all the people gathered there, that was an impossible request. Did Jesus really think that the disciples could feed the crowd? They'd stashed away enough food to feed 10,000 people, maybe? I mean, on its face, the request seems absurd. Jesus must have meant to do everything all along, no? But is that how we're supposed to live out Christian faith? Just counting on miracles? Well, we are Methodists, after all, which means that we are not an either-or people. We haven't been since our founding. John Wesley was not an either-or person. He was a both-and person. And so it should not surprise us that the answer to the question, should we take initiative or should we wait for God to do something, is yes. Wesley was, and we United Methodists are, Protestants through and through. But we're not like other Protestants. We have some interesting quirks, and I don't just mean the loud singing. See, Western Christianity has something of a dilemma. So the medieval Catholics insisted that salvation was an account, on account of works. The Protestant reformers insisted that salvation was by faith alone. But then the question could be reasonably asked, if God does all the saving, then why do I have to do anything? If, if it's all God's grace, then I don't even need to be a good person or do good deeds. If I did, that would mean that we're saved by our works, not by our faith. This is the Protestant dilemma. It's the why be good question. Whenever I would teach my undergrads about Protestant theology, when we'd get to this part, they'd always raise their hand and say, then why should people be good? <laughs> Now, the reformers, Martin Luther, first of all, believed in justification by grace through faith. Because he believed, like his spiritual ancestor Augustine before him, that human beings were incapable of actually doing good things. Anything you did that was good was only good because God gave you the grace to do it. Left to your own, you would have always chosen the evil option. The Calvinists would even refer to this as the total depravity of humanity. But Wesley didn't think that way. Wesley spent a fair amount of time studying the Eastern Fathers, the writings of and teachings of the all too overlooked in the West Orthodox Church. And the Orthodox have a different understanding of human nature. They don't see human beings as totally depraved. They don't see us as incapable of doing good. They believe in something called the synergia, or as we would say, synergy, which literally means working together. And they believe that God and humanity work together. That God provides the grace to empower human beings such that human beings can choose to do the good and right thing. And what this means is that for Methodists, our good works are not the requirement of our salvation, they are the fruit of our already having been saved. God has already accomplished our salvation, and God's grace now empowers us to be holier, 
in our personal living, in our social, communal living. This is the idea known as sanctification. And it's another Eastern idea, another Methodist idea. And as strange as it may sound, on these points, we Methodists have more in common with our Orthodox brothers and sisters than we do with the Presbyterians and the Lutherans. And thus we come to the response to our dilemma. Do we try to feed the people, or do we wait for God to take action? The answer is yes. Because in the end, we recognize that we are not God. We cannot, without God's help, solve all of the problems of the world. We cannot erect the kingdom of God ourselves. But we do the work of the kingdom. We do it anyway. We testify to the kingdom by living into the kingdom through our actions. See, in humility, we can acknowledge that the job is too big for us. We've got only five loaves and two fish. But we know that God will bring the kingdom and in the kingdom, no one will be left unfed. And so we can live into that kingdom as best we can in the here and now, trying to feed as many as we can, even as we await the coming of the heavenly banquet and leave the door open for a miracle. We know that the problems of structural racism and injustice are too great, but we know that God will bring the kingdom and in the kingdom, there is a multitude from every tribe and nation and language and race. And so we can live into that kingdom the best we can in the here and now, working for justice, standing up to hate, examining the invisible structures of racism and oppression, even as we await that great multitude and leave the door open for a miracle. We know that war and violence are a problem seemingly too great to solve, but we know that God will bring the kingdom. And in the kingdom, the wolf lies down with the lamb and the lion eats straw like the ox. And the swords are beaten into plowshares and the spears are beaten into pruning hooks. And so we can live into that kingdom in the here and now, working for peace and reconciliation, even as we await the peaceable kingdom and leave the door open for a miracle. So we are limited in our abilities. And when we forget that, we get ourselves into trouble. But at the same time, we are called to take action. So Jesus told us to feed the multitude, knowing that we couldn't do it alone. But in that command, he gave us his expectation that we would unite our faith and our action, that we would trust in God and in him but also to work to live out the values of the kingdom in the midst of the broken world. Deus ex machina endings are always seen as cheap shortcuts. Well, not always. There are those who, like Tolkien, defended their use, arguing that they reminded us of our connection to the powers of the divine is that they don't just work because we like happy endings. They work because they remind us that we're not alone in this struggle. That the labor to build a just, a righteous, and peaceful world is not our work alone, it's God's work. Our Savior calls us to take up that work, but then stands beside us in the lonely places and finishes it with us. Oh, oh, oh.
Since we are, whoops, since we are at a distance, we cannot consecrate the elements remotely. I cannot reach through the interwebs and sanctify the bread and the grape juice or other drink that you may have in front of you. But we will gather to commemorate our Lord's Last Supper. We will gather to reflect upon what he did and what it means for us. So if you have any food and drink, now would be a great time to bring them um, and to join in this commemoration of our Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Your Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, when nothing existed but chaos, you spoke but a word, and light was separated from darkness. That word came to your prophets and empowered them to speak for justice and righteousness. That word in time became flesh and dwelled among us and helped us in further knowledge of you. That word continues with us even today to empower us to share what we have to preach hope of the kingdom to a broken and hurting world. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived among us, knew human pain and suffering, who healed the sick, who cast out the demons of the afflicted, who fed the multitude, who raised the dead, and who showed us new life in your name. He ate with sinners and others whom you had rejected and welcomed them into the community of faith. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks. And he gave it to his disciples to drink, saying, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us to, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup which we drink is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I invite you now to partake of your meal in remembrance of our Lord's Last Supper. Love's were broken, words were spoken by the Galilean shore. Jesus' bread of life from heaven was their food forevermore. By your body broken for us, by your wife of life abhorred, Jesus Again, your people be a host of life, the Lord. Songs were broken, words were spoken in the quiet room one night. In the bread and wine you gave them, Christ you came as light from light. By your body broken for us, like the wine of life of God. Jesus, lead again your people, be a host alive alone. Love's a broken, words are spoken, as in faith we gather here. Jesus speaks across the ages, I am with you, do not flee. By your body broken for us, by your wine of life outpoured, Jesus be again your people, be a host of life alone. I the Lord to break and keep us, send us in your name to share. Bread for each the 
Gracious God, we give you thanks for this holy meal in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to now join in singing our closing hymn, number 427, where across the crowded ways of life. All the world shall learn your love and follow where your feet have trod, till glorious from your heaven above shall come the city of our God. Till that moment, we live into that city. We live into that kingdom by living out the love, the justice, the hope, the peace, even now. And so go into the world to live out that love. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.